Hello everyone, a very good afternoon to everyone present here. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar today. Our speaker for today is Boris Goncharov. He is an information security enthusiast and a visionary with over 16 years of operations and information security experience. He's currently working as VP of strategy at Amtas, where he is focused on envisioning the future of security and defining customer protection strategies and tactics. Over to you, Boris. All right, thank you for this introduction. Great to be here today. Welcome, everyone. Today, we have a very interesting topic, actually. Uh, it's about, you know, dealing with the problems uh, of cyber honeypots. Well, some of you may say, well, are we still using those things, really? Are they not extinct already? We have so many advanced technology nowadays that this is something that probably from the past, but it's not really. This kind of a technology actually evolved uh, very rapidly, especially recently. And now we see uh, the new face of um, cyber honeypots. They're they, they not called this. They're kind of a, just part of, uh, of a bundle of solutions called deception, deceptive technologies. So now we're going to talk more about deceptive technologies, not too much about the honeypot themselves, because they are just a single, kind of a small part of this whole concept of, of using these technologies to kind of contract and defend your network from, from intruders, from attackers, and you know ensure efficient protection of your enterprise. It's very exciting in many ways. Uh, this is kind of a more more different concept in security compared to the, the stuff that we normally do. Because, you know, defensive strategies normally are very passive in nature, right? So you cannot do too much except, you know, sitting and waiting for somebody to hit you and, you know, deflect the attack. So it's, you just are kind of a, you're, you, with your hands tied and you cannot do much in order to contract actively against some specific threat actor but deceptive technologies and cyber honeypots this kind of a stuff they are they're giving you something that the other approaches are not currently using and these are basically the ability to interact with the intruder in some ways and also to to actively track him down and even sometimes to counterattack in some cases so it's kind of very fascinating idea in security, one of the only instances in which we can actually be more pro more active, uh, more offensive, if you, if you like, towards the attackers. So, you know, cyber honeypots are gone. We're talking about now deceptive technologies. This is something that, you know, brings a lot of opportunities, really exciting in security. So we're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about also some of the issues that we face with these technologies. And some guidelines how you can actually you know make these things working well for your organizations and adopt this technology in an efficient way for your enterprises so about deception really this is uh, definitely something that it's not really uh, coming today as a topic deception in general it's very old tactics very very old actually deception as a concept this this is a quote from Sun Tzu, very old one actually, the art of war. And you know, this concept, as you can see, is very well, you know, defining what deception really means in terms of a kind of a military action, right? So it's kind of a lying to your enemy. You know, lying about your abilities to attack, lie about what you're doing currently, how you are actually preparing for the attack. What are your forces really? You know. Uh, you know, what your plans are, what is your strategy, deceiving somebody, you know, that's the main, the name of the game. It's about deceiving your opponents, it's about deceiving your enemies. And, you know, you want them to believe that, you know, whatever you're doing is not going to kind of uh, be very dangerous to them. Really. So the same thing we can, we can face now in the digital world, it's the same concept. So you see, we're trying to deceive the attackers. We try to look weak, look unprotected, and use this as a tool, as a vehicle 
to capture the attacker, to untrap the attacker and track his activities. And of course, at some point when we gather enough information about his activities to hand over this to uh, some, you know, to the response teams, or we can actually uh, also contact the authorities and so on and so forth. Depends on the situation. But this also gives a very interesting perspective on security because this allows us to learn how attacker thinks, to learn how attacker attack our infrastructure, and to examine in a real, almost near real time, his activities, to track his steps, you know, and of course draw conclusions. Because whatever we do in defenses, let's face it, defenses are really boring. It's like eating vegetables, you know. You just have to do it all the time in order to see some benefits, right? You cannot just sit at once and, you know, forget about it. It's the same thing. Defenses are really boring. Every day, the same thing. You are under attack. You, are, you try to deflect this. And, you know, it's not really, it's not really you know, uh, exciting too much. Really. And if something goes wrong, which is in the normal case, you know, in the normal case, you get fired or you have problems. Because eventually there will be some crack on the law wall or there will be kind of a minor vulnerability that somebody will exploit, or there'll be something that you don't even see as a problem and is gonna be exploited by your enemies. So you see this problem, it's something that you know we are struggling with all the time because normally people in defenses are not really with the same mindset as an attacker, right? Attacking, it's the, to attack somebody, it's far, far much more, let's say, exciting, even sexy if you like, but, the difference between defenses and offenses is that offensive activities are more focused, I will say laser focused on achieving a specific target or a specific objective. And you as a defender, you have to defend the whole infrastructure. You cannot just focus on one piece of that infrastructure and just monitor that specific you know, thing. You have to see this in a very comprehensive manner. You have to throw your resources everywhere in order to defend this. And the attacker, he's just focused on something to achieve specific thing really and to exploit your infrastructure so you cannot be you cannot have the same type of understanding normally as the attacker you cannot see his the way he thinks normally it's like a chess you know chess game you have to foresee his moves in order to make sure that you can you know contract otherwise you lose the battle and you know your 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 company gets compromised so that's really important distinguishment between offenses and defenses and we are in the losing side, guys. Let's face it. We at security, we are at the losing side because we have so many things to do. We have jobs. So we have so many things to do. It's not only that we are, you know, doing one thing at a time. We have to focus on too much things at the same time. And let's say we don't have enough resources to deal with all these things. Really. So this, you know, this poses some challenges towards today's environment, right? And these are challenges related to detection and response mainly. This is, this is the hot, you know, uh, the hot topic right now, because these are security operations that we almost every company needs nowadays because the attacks are very comprehensive. The attacker gets smarter. They use also smart technologies. They use so many tools. They use so many, you know, new, new stuff, new knowledge, and they apply these, you know, offenses towards your infrastructure. Sometimes we're talking about very well organized criminal groups, very well, or even sometimes states, countries that have these capabilities and can attack different infrastructure in, in the world. So we need to be able to operationalize our security. We should be able to monitor whatever happens in our environment and you know, provide an adequate response to those attacks. So what we are facing, this is not something kind of a, like a very kind of a surprising to anyone. But this is actually coming from one of the, one of the latest research on Ponomon Institute. Uh, and they, you know, they ask what, what you're facing as a kind of a security operations center, your security operation, what kind of a, uh, challenges this security operations center faces on, a, on kind of a, on a daily basis? What are the main concerns in your activities? So as you can see, you know, we have all the usual suspects in this slide, right? We have uh, in negligent insiders, negligent insiders, these are non malicious people. They're just negligent. They're just not doing that it's supposed to be doing. They just click everywhere and whatever. So they pose a big threat. Also, of course, we have malicious or criminal insiders, you know, 
these are the people they want to harm your organization because let's say they are mad at your boss or whatever. Of course, we see a lot of web-based tech, not surprised at all because everything is almost web-based, whatever you do today. Third-party security risk, this is more, more, more difficult to handle because now what was the difference between today and you know yesterday, some years ago was that you know the infrastructure and you know it was like, what is like like a castle very well distinguished you know distinguished be between your world and, and the and the outside world so your castle you know with the borders and everything was really easy to kind of define but now we have moving you know boundaries we, we don't have these castles anymore this castle is kind of a stretch across the whole internet we are interacting with so many third parties with so many other you know entities that and exchange information with them clouds vendors partners you know clients customers whatever you exchange it so you are a moving target so they, you don't have any castle anymore what you have is just a flow of data and information everywhere and you have to try to kind of a using your bare hands to patch this flow of information and protect that information whatever it goes really and of course, you don't have any control over third parties, or you have a very limited control. Of course, advanced malware, machine learning powered, AI powered malware, consumerized malware, whatever. It's so much complicated than it used to be before. When I was preparing this presentation, you know, I was, I was kind of going back in time, looking to honeypots in the beginning. Well, and that this reminds me about how things were easy back then. <laughs> you know, a very sim kind of a very simplistic concept behind these attacks, right? Very simple malware, very simple problems that we need to, to solve. Of course, the technology was not there to help us too much, but you know, the, the life was easier, right? Now it's very much more complicated. You know, advanced malware is a big threat that we have to handle. Insecure endpoints, of course, especially now with, with the COVID, post-COVID situation. Everybody works from home, everybody works from a mobile device, whatever. It's a really hard job to defend these things, really. Insecure web applications, that's the normal, the new normal, let's say, unfortunately because we rush to develop new exciting products and services for our customers. We put them in the internet just in front of everybody, but they're not developed with security in mind and they, get, they can be easily compromised. The now service attacks, they're not gone, they're still here, used as a tool, as a vehicle normally for other attacks sometimes. Intellectual property theft, very important problem as well. System glitches, so on and so forth. These are the main concerns, but this is not surprising to anyone, right? I think this is something that everyone knows in security. And you know this is some this kind of a top list of problems. It's kind of changing slightly throughout the years. <clears throat> it increases sometimes in different areas, but I, I think everybody agrees that this is something that we face on a daily basis. One of the biggest issues that we see uh, in security operations is how to properly address the cyber queue chain, because you know we are not talking about just having sporadic events happening in our environment and just kind of a, a small event security event related and just popping up in our screens in security operation center just okay that, that small event means whatever we're not talking about this we're talking about very comprehensive type of attacks multi-staged attacks so the attackers are not just throwing some code at you they're just doing as a kind of a attack do you have attack process behind that's why we have now moving towards to understanding the the whole process behind a specific uh, security event. It's not just one thing, you know, just a single sporadic thing happening. You have to tr track down the whole, let's say, moves and uh, the whole process behind initiating and launching and executing an attack on your environment. So it's very complicated. You may see some kind of glitches here and there. You can see some kind of events popping up of your screen, but maybe they're just part of a more comprehensive thing. You know, it's not just click here, whatever, it just, so much more complex. So you have to track down the attacker throughout the whole life cycle of this attack. So this is the cyber kill chain. Of course, now we have frameworks for that, like Mitra, AT, TNCK, for instance. Some have some others. They're not perfect, but they're trying to, to put the, you know, they establish the right context. The context is that we're talking about security related, attack related process. We're not talking about just events. And that's a big difference between what we used to do before in security. So attack, this is just a summary of this attack queue chain. This is one of, you know, maybe the fans of Lord of the Rings recognizes this. This is Helm's Deep. It's a very, you know, clear analogy here. 
again, we used to have castles, we don't have them anymore. But anyway, the idea is to, this is your, you know, castle, this is the Helm's Deep that you own, your infrastructure, you know, whatever you prefer, you're, you're protecting. And this is, let's say, heavily protected. So the first idea, of course, of the attacker is to infiltrate, bridge the castle, as you remember from the books and the movies, they use some kind of a new tools and technologies to do that. The orcs, if you remember it, they blow up the wicked point in the protection wall. They enter that and they just gonna flood it with, uh, with the attackers and they over overtaking the uh, the castle. Of course, Gandalf, the you know the white repute that everybody was saying. Attackers to penetrate your environment. This can happen very slowly sometimes in a very smart way. It doesn't have to happen very quickly. People get smarter. The attackers get smarter. They are not doing this very in a very noisy way, unless they are some script kids trying to just launch some specific tools found on the internet and following YouTube clips how to do that. But breaching the castle, number one, then lateral movement. You just try to move inside of that environment. You try to search for for uh, for the good stuff, for the juicy stuff. I mean, credentials, you know, data, you know, wiki account, whatever. I mean. This is your goal. You're trying to find something to, to to explore, and you move throughout the castle. You find your weak spots, and you attack them. And you, of course, you can you can overcome the the whole thing. And of course, the third uh, stage is exfiltration, which means basically taking whatever you found and get out of there without even somebody noticing you. You know, the, the real difference between Helm's deep attack and a digital attack today is that the attacker normally don't want to get you know. To be noticed when while, while he is doing stuff like that. So, as you can see, to detect this, it sounds simplistic, you know, the, the whole process. But in order to technically detect these activities, in, as I look at them as a kind of a process, it's not much more complicated, right? And sometimes you may not even have, maybe you don't have the tools to spot these activities in the right time, and you you lose this upper hand sometimes, and sometimes you you can end up in a situation that you see the attacker while he's living already or whatever, or even even haven't you know discovered them at all. Uh, there was kind of estimation that normally this takes sometimes you, can, you know it takes two hundred days whatever to understand that you've been hacked or compromised. Depends on your defenses. That's why you know we see deception technologies coming to play here in order to make sure that you spot the attacker on early stages of this attack and will be able to, to kind of a contract at the right time. Otherwise, you may lose your Helm's Deep or whatever you have in your environment. This is just a, a summary of you know, what we see as, a, as a challenges and the importance of this uh, security operation center activities, the detection response activities, and what is the state of today's security operation center. As you can see, these are coming again from Ponemon Institute research. Uh, the number one concern, as you can see, is minimization of false positives. Because we have so many event data, so many things happening in our environment, it's very hard to properly distinguish legitimate attack from some other sporadic events in your environment. So again, using deceptive technologies can greatly decrease false positives. They can provide you with the assurance needed to say that this is an actual attack, it's not just a noise in your network. So intelligence reporting, this is very interesting compared to what we've seen before, that threat intelligence grows as an importance. And this is some indication that this kind of a you know new approach, threat intelligence driven security pressure center is becoming real now. But again, Helipods or deceptive technologies, let's say, can be used also to help you with your threat intelligence objectives. Depends on your, we're not talking about insight implementation, I'm talking about something that can be used as a HoneyNet project, for instance, to collect globally information about attacker behaviors and you know attacker patterns and new IOCs and TTPs used in your environment. So this is something that can help you to, to kind of weaponize this concept Monitoring and analyzing alerts, of course, this is obvious problem that needs to be done. Intrusion detection, again, again, considering the whole process, not just the events. This is technology automation and machine learning. This is growing in importance, of course, because this helps to minimize, again, the noise and to discover this pattern of behavior, which is not normally 
uh, you, you're not normally able to do this with the classic tools like CM systems and log generating uh, type of uh, systems. Agile DevOps, I see this is interesting again, growing in importance. And this is, I think, a right way to look at this because if you have dev, Agile DevOps, it can be very adaptive to what you're doing in security. It's going to help you a lot. Threat hunting, again, this is about discovering IOCs, discovering artifacts in your environment and trying to proactively find them in your network. Again, with deceptive technology, this job can be done far much more effective, in a far much more effective way. And forensics and so on and so forth. What are the main pains for the security operations center today? Well, a lot of them actually, but number one for me is alert fatigue, basically. Alert fatigue. You have so much of this, event, so many, so many data thrown throwing at your security operations center. You cannot properly handle all this information. You will have a millions and millions, even in small organizations, we have some millions of events per 24 hour period normally even for uh, imagine if this is a big enterprise how much actually data we're talking about here so to collect this to process and to contextualize this data it's a huge problem right even if you have the greatest cm system on the planet or whatever it's still not enough to to help you properly to handle this problem a little fatigue is a huge issue with uh, detection response and security pressure center. Again, deception technologies can greatly reduce false positive and they can actually focus you on real activities initiated by real attackers. Staffing expertise, huge problem in security. You're well aware, aware of that. Simply, we don't have enough security people on the planet. We have to grow them somehow. We have to make them. But you know, people are not made in a few days, unfortunately. This is far in the future, probably. So we cannot create security people out of thin air, unfortunately. Fortunately for us as security people, but unfortunately for our organizations, because they have to deal with this operational problem. And you know, in order to properly process this information and be able to properly detect malicious activity, you have to have the expertise in your hand. And this is some very you know difficult thing to, to acquire. An ability to inability to capture actionable intelligence is another problem because, yeah, well. You may have so many data, but we have to be, this has to be actionable. I mean, you have to act upon this data. It's not just collecting this just a pure, uh, just out of pure interest or just kind of as a hobby. You know, security related information is important, but if you cannot use it, it's, it's just waste. You cannot do nothing about it. Again, information overload, I talked about this a lot. I think this is obvious concern that has to be properly addressed. Workload cases, burnout, this is for the people side of the problem. You know, they have so many things to investigate when they have these events coming to their screens. And, you know, they just have, you know, they just burn out, you know, they cannot handle this properly. Uh, and the ability to prioritize threats, huge problem again, coming from the same issue, but the deceptive technologies here can greatly help you with that. Because again, they will focus you on the actual attacks, not just on the, some kind of a stupid user kind of doing some stupid stuff in your network, right? Complexity and health, obviously, and lack of resources, people, technologies, investments, especially post-COVID and COVID today. So what is the what is the treatment here? What we can do about it? Well, we can do a lot of things actually, or we could just do, don't do anything really. Number one choice for your management problem. Don't do anything. We don't have money. So let's stop doing whatever, you know. We will survive somehow. Well, of course, this insecurity doesn't work very well. Or you can increase detection, let's say, capabilities. Okay, you can inject more technologies. You can become more comprehensive in your environment to detect more and more and more. But as we seen before in the previous slide, this is going to overload your operations, and you're going to lose the upper hand. We're going to lose the you're going to lose the ability to contract these attacks. Of course, our suggested approach and one of the best you know, ways to, to address most of these challenges is to use deception-based detection. Deception-based detection, which is something that we are you know, you know, talking about today. Deception, what's this exactly supposed to mean? You know, you, you wrote the quote from the beginning, but 
what it means of course means lying everybody knows how to lie but he has to lie in a such a way that everybody will believe him and not only lying but using this against your opponent and your uh, against your enemies i will give you an example very briefly in history by the way this is example also from steganography the history of steganography which is the same art the art of deception is also used in steganography as a concept so this guy we don't have a live picture of him or selfie because he lived some time ago this is the father of all historians herodot so herodot describes a really interesting case in his uh, in his writings and you see this is a white rabbit picture not from the same period i guess we don't have any statues of white rabbits i'm aware of but anyway that's another story so what's the story here why he's talking about white rabbits you know the bugs bunny whatever you want to call that well the reason for that is very interesting because the town the hometown of one of the noblemen in Sirius was under siege and it was heavily guarded by foreign troops right and this nobleman i think the name was asperger but i'm not sure so don't take note on that so this nobleman living in the city wanted to transmit a secret message to the neighboring town and you know ask for help for assistance from the troops there so because it was not possible to send his servant just directly say okay i need to translate the message to my friends here he needed to do this in, in kind of a to conceal this in such a way that nobody will notice that and will not expose him to whatever so he ended up with a very ingenious idea actually so he says to, he orders his servant to go to the fields and capture a white rabbit right and he did so so he took the right rabbit you know kill it of course and uh, they took the, the right message just fold it down and basically stuck into the stomach of the rabbit just stick it stick it directly i'm sorry for the rabbit but this was used in this case to trust his message so he took the rest so he said to, to the servant okay now dress like a huntsman take the white rabbit with you and say to the guards that you're going to deliver some you know to your master in the neighboring town right and he did so so and he was going there and uh, nobody was noticing it because you know he was he was dressed like a huntsman he was carrying a white animal killed nothing wrong with that but inside of that rabbit it was a secret message transmitted to uh, to the friends of this nobleman and of course he cut open the animal uncovered the message and was provided some assistance this is a historical example of steganography but again this is a very good example of of deception I, I heard I uh, was reading somewhere somewhere very interesting example also of a Trojan horse in Troy but do you know this to analogy to work for deception this means that instead of the story that we know imagine that the guys in Troy in Troy was actually aware of that was going on inside of that uh, horse a wooden horse and they were prepared for that and they allowed this to happen to some extent right and they opened even the gates slightly and do you imagine these foreign troops coming in and they close the doors and they're ready with arrows and everything and you know the, the, the troops are surrendering and whatever it, the history is going to be having a different end if this was happening this is the deception in practice and the same thing applies for for uh, for cyber world today so let's have some examples here right Cyber of cyber deception technologies that we use today so we're not talking about only honeypots anymore we're talking about cyber deception technologies this is one of the examples using honey tokens okay what are these honey tokens all about well this is a kind of a resource it can be credentials data records browser cookies or ews keys for instance encryption keys well and there the reason that we do you know you know spread this across the environment is to attract the the attackers they attract the attackers and if they are using that tokens for some in some way maliciously you normally have a beacon or other way to detect these attempts to compromise this and they send you a notification they call back home and say listen somebody's tampering with this you have to draw your attention towards that so honey tokens is about attracting they're kind of a look legitimate 
they look interesting from they have a, a hug value which means they are interested for for somebody to be attacked this is an example of a project spacecraft uh, from atlassian company basically it's an open source tool set it's about uh, you know enabling so generating and you know distributing fake ews keys because clouds are you know of course the name of the game today and uh, you know us you know passwords are very weak but now when you when you talk about let's say cloud infrastructure or amazon infrastructure ews keys are like a keys to the kingdom so if you have that you can do a lot of other things you can over over overtake the entire control panels and whatever on your ews environment ec2 environment so the problem with this is that <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry it's not only about you know having these keys in your hands but and trying to get you know access to the main control panel of the cloud but also to use this within apis which is far much more less protected compared to the other stuff we have so the idea behind this is to have this keys generated you know monitored and you know uh, you know used in order to detect suspicious activities another piece of technology that of course is the name of this you know presentation is about honeypots but now you see the honeypots evolved so much today and they're part of this cyber deception uh, technology of course you very well know this is a kind of a heavily monitored and forced you know security let's say not enforced too much but heavily monitored in, in terms of uh, activities real or simulated systems right they can be virtual machines they can be actual systems they can be something that you know can have only let's say limited services running it's like a low interaction honeypots they are just having some kind of a just a service and somebody can interact with that service like ftp ssh whatever and this can trigger alarm for the for the security version stuff so the idea behind this of course to be easy target this is a sitting duck in your environment and the, the attacker found this you know easy target say oh my god i found you know bingo i have this great machine it's open it's not protected so i'm just gonna directly attack this machine and then and, and good to go and you're just luring this you just put this honeypot inside of your network and somebody you expect somebody to be uh, interested in this and as soon as he is actually going inside we can start to track identify his activities and a construct this concept may sound great but in reality as we know from history it's not really that great you know this by the way this screenshot is one of the first concepts uh for uh for you know uh honeypot 1998 this is the uh deception toolkit developed by fred Cohen. one of the first let's say uh, you know implementations of this concept uh as you can see we have a lot of uh, services you can uh, emulate you can uh, dns ftp whatever ssh telnet so you can simulate these services and you can expect this um, attacker to interact with the services and they can spot him and you know contract the problem with this is that we, we know that we have two implementation of these technologies you know honeypot technologies one is low interaction and the other high interaction or high fidelity honeypots well low fidelity or low interaction honeypots are not that risky normally because there are not so many things that you the attacker can do with this because they're just emulated services sometimes but when you're talking about high interaction honeypots or high fidelity honeypots now the problem is bigger because this can be actual machine sitting in your network right and there are so many actually cases in which these machines can be actually really compromised the attacker first of all can detect that this is actually not a real machine or this is a honeypot and if he knows that the whole concept is blown away the whole value of uh, deception is faded you know, so you need to properly protect that machine. But if this if the attacker overcomes this and he takes over this machine, he can of course use that against you, and you can end up in a, with a bigger problem <laughs> that you're trying to solve, and you have a liability problem behind that as well. But we're going to talk about this later. Another technology that is you now used in deception: breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs. <laughs> 
yeah, actual breadcrumbs like Hansel and Gretel that kind of stuff. So these are basically pieces of data, right? Which is kind of spilled out across your infrastructure. This can be whatever. It can be files, it can be documents, or email log files, entries, resources, system resources. So they're just printed everywhere in the environment. But the idea here is to kind of a point that the, the kind of a push the attacker towards the some other deception uh, technologies like honeypots inside of the network. So the idea is just to kind of a guide him gently to a specific machine that is heavily monitored, and you can actually, uh, you know, further exploit this attacker and contract him. So the idea, as you can see on this, so this is actually a proof of concept. You can find this on GitHub. This is Honeybits project. And the concept is very, uh, very ingenious. Actually, you have this, uh, you know, breadcrumbs or honey tokens spread across your network on actual machines. It can be, let's say, plain text username, passwords, or sensitive documents, fake setting documents, whatever. They may have also beacons, which can actually just say that somebody is touching me or whatever. <laughs> but uh, the idea is to lure the attacker to guide him through the network and then point him to a fake server or fake machine that is heavily you know, exploitable, a honeypot. So the main concept here is to, to lure the attacker towards this machine. So basically, when you use this combination of these things, really, you can achieve very well the, the objectives of deception, really. Well, but, you know, other examples of these uh, breadcrumbs can be, let's say, fake bash history, for instance, commands. It can be uh, fake entries in, in host ARP tables, fake browser history, if you like, injected fake credentials, let's say, uh, registry keys, whatever, fake EWS credentials or whatever. So it can be a lot of things that limit your imagination. But of course, this has to be properly managed in order to achieve this objective. Well. This quote is not from Sun Tzu, it's coming from me. In order for the deception to work, you need somebody to be deceived. This is the, the number one problem in deception. You know, the whole premise of deception lies on that, really. You have to be able to, to kind of uh, deceive the attack. Otherwise, you lose your time and your resources, and even you can get compromised far much more gravely than normally. So. Of course, you have to assume that the attackers are not dumb users, right? They have their own ways to spot and detect, spot and detect honeypots or deceptive technologies. Otherwise, it's going to be too easy, right? But people are smart. They are not. They are also looking at this and say, "Listen, let's find a way how we can detect these things, and even sometimes how to use them against the defenders." and uh, exploit them even greatly. I'm going to give you just a very basic examples of uh, ways you can detect that. So these are not the comprehensive things. We don't have time for that, of course, but very simply, this is showdown search engine. You know that this is very well. Uh, but this is kind of a better version of Hello. 
Uh, hi everyone. I think we are experiencing a slight uh, technical glitch. Boris should be back shortly. Hello, Ken. I think we lost the connection for a while. Yeah, but Boris, now it's no back problem. on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry yeah, about it. Okay. Well, technology, what you can do, you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> everything is normal now. Sorry about that. Somebody's hacking me, probably. Uh, so another example, uh, it's uh, another project you can find in GitHub. Honeypot Buster <clears throat> is the tool. It's a Windows PowerShell based uh, tool that you can use to detect uh, different deception technologies in your infrastructure, mm. like uh, like this type of a uh, you know thing that you can have. So basically, it's uh, Kerber roasting service accounts, honey tokens, let's say, is something that you can uh, that can detect fake computer accounts, honey pots, fake credentials manager, breadcrumbs, fake domain admin accounts, honey tokens, fake map drives, breadcrumbs, uh, DNS records manipulation, honey pots, and some others. So this tool is very simplistic. Again, it's not really comprehensive too much, but it can be useful sometimes to detect the presence of deceptive technologies. Uh, for instance, uh, fake map drives, breadcrumbs can be used. Normally, they are used to detect uh, ransomware attacks, for instance, because you know normally some of the ransomware are using SMB protocol to spread across the network or through different some kind of open shares. You see that, so this can detect you know because you know this can be very efficient to detect this kind of uh, activities or well, malware spread or whatever. Then later on, this can be examined or. Um, Fake credentials manager, whatever. These are the exact honey tokens and breadcrumbs uh, detection too. A lot of other things you can do with that. But uh, mm, the reason why this exists is, of course, to make sure that the attacker gets detected properly. But in the same time, if you know that, that these things are present in your environment, you can use them against the, the defenders. Okay. So this is very important thing to understand here that. Uh, the technology that you can use here, it's very important to be properly rolled out and implemented. Otherwise, it, you know, the whole concept is going to be wasted and you will expose yourself to a greater risks in the environment. So the key concern in deception is this deception actually to be deceiving and the attacker to, be, to believe that this deception is real. Well, this is one of my recommendations. If you want to implement this kind of a stuff, the best way to do that when you roll out some, some kind of a stuff like that is to test it internally or ask, ask, ask somebody, you know, as a consultant or whatever, to kind of analyze what he sees in your environment and whether he can distinguish deception from the actual systems. If this is not done in the right way, well, you lose everything. So very important notice here is that, you know, you have to properly implement this and you have to properly maintain this dynamically because this is not a static environment. It requires different, not different, but dedicated resource to in order to achieve that, right? So talking about risks and deceptions, right? There are four main concerns with and, and problems with deception technology. Disclosure of deception, deception disclosure. And this is a very obvious problem that we discussed you know, within, within this presentation that you have to keep this as real as possible. And you have to make sure that this deception technology is not easily identifiable. Otherwise, the attacker may use this against you and may achieve his objectives far much more easily sometimes. So disclosure is number one concern. The second concern is takeover, deception takeover, which means that like, let's say, breaching the, the honeypots, taking them down or exploiting them fully. And in this case, some, there are some very good examples of using honeypot computers, let's say, or servers to spread or to launch different DDoS attacks or spread the malware to other computers, not only inside of the, your network. So there are so many examples of this, if this security is not properly addressed, 
on the honeypot level, you may have a huge issue with this concept and you may have a huge problems with the uh, with your defenses. So it's very important to protect properly the deception technologies that you use. Of course, we have uh, now we have a lot of virtual machines uh, stuff. We have uh, we, this can be used you know, uh, container based security sometimes for some of the uh, deception technology used, but nothing is granted. Security on the on the honeypot or deception technology level, it's even you know more demanding sometimes. So whatever you do with this technology, you have to properly secure and protect all the elements of this infrastructure. Another concern can be privacy. Privacy. So what's the problem with that? Well, well, now let's say we in Europe. We have more stricter regulations towards privacy, right? We have GDPR, and this is kind of very demanding in terms of privacy and you know, personal data protection. The problem with honeypots is that, or deception technology, is that you may disclose a lot of personal information, and you may, may you may argue with me and say, "Listen, but this is the attacker. This is the bad guy. We're trying to track down here. What's the problem?" Well, you don't know whether this is an attacker or not, or just some kind of a uh somebody's uh, just doing some uh you know not really you know malicious activities you know which he's just scanning something whatever it's not necessarily sometimes depends on the face of the attack it's not really always necessary this to be a malicious uh, attacker so you can have his ip address you can have other information from his computer system you can have uh, your username you can have your his real name so these are privacy related information and you may have problem with that and I'm not saying this is your biggest concern, but this is a legitimate concern that needs to be properly addressed. Otherwise, you can, you know, you, you may have problem with your regulators if you don't address this problem. So it's kind of a contra contradicting the concept, right? But you have to bear in mind this problem. Otherwise, this can kind of uh, blow in your face at one point, and we have may have issues with that. Another, this is a more organizational level. It's not too technical, but liability. What? What liability has to play? Uh, what kind of role plays liability here? Well, <coughs> if you use a honeypot systems right in your environment and these systems get exploited, this can result in a litigation case against you. Let's say somebody can, you know, this is coming from your environment and this machine is used to uh, DDoS some other computer systems around the, you know, the internet or whatever, or this machine is used to spread malware. You name it, or spam, it doesn't matter. You're breaking laws in this case, and you're liable. So, in this means that you have to have me, you can be penalized, you can be prosecuted, or whatever. So, you have to bear this in mind as well. Again, this goes back to the previous problem that we talked about the security of the deception technology used. It's crucial. So, if you don't secure properly your environment, then you may have a liability down the road. There is another one here, which I didn't put it on purpose, which is uh, entrapment problem. Uh, it's, 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 a kind of a, it's kind of a more debatable issue. Enticement and entrapment. Entrapment is fine, I'm sorry, en enticement. Well, what's the difference between those things? You may argue that deception is entrapment which means basically you're putting something in your inside of your network it just sits there it doesn't actually ask somebody come here uh, hack me or whatever this is something that you know it's not the case but many people many legal experts are arguing whether this is not a form of enticement basically luring somebody actively to do something bad and this is not allowed because in this case you are forcing somebody to do something uh against let's say the law and you know this can be interpreted in such a way so this is some just kind of a side note to remember that enticement should be avoided at all costs so when you're implementing this technology you should think about this not to be asking somebody look 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 here this is a vulnerable server you know look you know do it do it you know this is something that you should not do otherwise you're liable liable and you know you have problems with that so this is just a side note. I didn't put it here because you know, this is debatable. It's a subject of discussion. It's not really clear whether it has a real uh, repercussions when you use this technology. 
most of these experts says deception is not enticement, so it's okay. But you never know. So the question here is how to achieve properly a deception in your environment. So what you think you should address here in order to properly have that covered? Well, number one thing, as we discussed in the beginning, you have to think about how to properly cover the, the attack kill chain, right? So in the previous iteration of this, uh, in this technology was just using honeypots, right? And the, the, uh, the concept behind this is just, okay, I have this honeypot computer here, right? And I'm just expecting this to be found by the attacker, right? And this can give me his, you know, his activities, right? But this is too limited, kind of very narrow understanding of this process because the attacker needs to bridge the network first, then he moves to the network, then see he reaches a specific point in time, this machine may he may continue to do so. But you know, you this may be too late. Maybe he'd already extracted some piece of information from the your network, or he didn't even found this vulnerable machine in the network. Nobody can guarantee that he's going to find it, even if it's very open, right? Or if it's too open, maybe this is very suspicious. So who knows? So if you don't cover the whole, you know, Q chain, it's just a wasted, uh, let's say, opportunity here yeah? because you have a very narrow understanding of the attack. Okay. So the good deception approaches today are, you know, using all the capabilities of that what we described you now honey tokens uses breadcrumbs using uh you know properly you know developed and established let's say honey pots and so on and so forth and using the right combination so you need to properly strategize around this technology if you're just rushing to buy something just because it's very exciting nothing going to happen if you need to proper strategy for that otherwise we're just spending money on nothing. Or we're just, you know, this is my favorite problem in security, just following vendors, whatever they say. Okay, this is the best thing you can do, buy it and everything will be fine. Whatever, the silver bullet, the holy grail, call it whatever you like, it doesn't exist. So deception, like any other technology in security, it needs to be properly planned and strategized in order to work in your environment because you need this to be looking as kind of a, to appear as real as possible it to be related to whatever you do if you just put something that is not really coherent with your environment <clears throat> it's going to be just you know obvious that you're using deception even on that level so you have to cover you have to have a comprehensive coverage of the attack kill chain of course of course you need to understand what actually you are protecting What exactly you are trying to protect in your environment? If you don't know that, you just want to protect everything, this is going to be a failure in a gigantic proportion, right? And a huge waste of money. So you need to know who's, what you're protecting. You need to understand who's your enemy, who you're trying to detect with this deception technology. Or, you know, you have to be also be ready to properly handle this deception alerts. If you don't have any experience in security operations, this can be very problematic because these attacks, this, this you know, technology requires somebody with the right piece of knowledge, with the right expertise to process this and to act upon these you know, alerts in the right way. So you need to be able to have a comprehensive response plan especially concerning these deception alerts because the, this, this alert is going to be different from let's say cm system that normally is used for that the other problem the other you know, it's not really a problem but uh, kind of something that you have to address properly it's scalability of that system now i think today this is not really a huge problem uh, maybe i can give you an example with some vendors like um, let's say elusive networks for instance they can you know, generate massive amount of uh, fake costs in your environment, for instance. So scalability, but scalability, not, it's not only about one environment, it's about how you can cover the complexity of your environment in full. So you may have some branches here and there in different countries. So you have to think about this 
how to scale this solution properly. Otherwise, you're gonna use the opportunity to properly detect the attacks. Because you know, let's face it, the attackers doesn't really care about only one location sometimes. They look at your organization as a comprehensive attack target, right? Authenticity. As we said, the things that you use as deception, as decoys, as breadcrumbs, as honey tokens, has to look legitimate, <laughs> authentic. If they don't look authentic, let's say you are looking, you are working in a, you know, in my country. Let's say you have an environment here. We use Cyrillic alphabet, and most of the stuff we have is kind of written in, you know, Cyrillic alphabet. And suddenly you have some other uh, Arabic written documents inside. For instance, and just very extreme example of this, you know, kind of a mis. Uh, uh, misconfiguration of this kind of stuff. So you need to have, or you know, you have to get this. This, this, these things has to be related to your to your business. It has to be related to your organization. It should not be like just dumped there without any context. And in other words, they don't gonna look authentic to the attackers. So we have to be preparing this, and it has to kind of be similar to your environment, right? So this is very important as well. Otherwise, the whole value of deception is lost if, it, if, if deception is discovered, right? Security, you know, I mentioned this before, so security is crucial. If you don't protect, especially high interaction elements of the uh, deception technology, this can backfire at you really hard. So protecting the especially high interaction elements of the infrastructure, deception infrastructure is crucial. If you don't protect this properly, it's going to have a huge impact on your operations. Comprehensiveness. Well, the good deception is about having kind of a variety of stuff and so on. So, as you can see with the honey tokens and the breadcrumbs, can be there can be so many things that you can use in order to detect this. So you have to think very comprehensively. It can be sometimes some detection technologies like you know can simulate ATMs, can simulate uh, banking systems, they can simulate um, IoT devices, they can simulate a lot of things. So you need to have this kind of a um, variety of things that you're doing in order to increase the detection value, kind of increase the probability to detect these intruders and also to be more successful at discovering their activities. As I said, strategy is crucial. If you're just rushing to implement this without any understanding of the, of the you know, of how you know how it works technically, but not only how to operationalize this and how to maintain this, you have a problem. And again, capability. You have to be able to deal with this technology on a daily basis. Otherwise, you may see some alerts coming and there is nobody to respond back to them properly, or they don't have enough knowledge to deal with this technology and to deal with these alerts in your environment. Okay. So this is in very kind of a compact way describing the, the main issues and the main strategies around achieving good deception technologies and what you should be paying attention to. So uh, there, this is a very interesting topic. As you can see, there are a lot of other you know, things happening on that front. And it's very exciting from many perspectives in terms of you know, security value. So uh, everybody should be considering this approach very carefully. It has really, uh, it can be, it's not very difficult now to, to use this technology. It's not like before, because you needed to plan this. You have to maintain this very in a very different way, but now it's far much more easier, but this doesn't mean that it's trivial. It means that it requires capability and knowledge. But again, very interesting concept, advancing very rapidly and giving a lot of uh, opportunities for the security operations teams to handle these state-of-the-art attacks we're seeing today. And with that, we'd like to thank you for your, uh, for your attention. And uh, sorry. And if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to. Uh, or if you if there is not enough time, I can suggest also to to uh, to write these questions down and we can answer them after this event. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Boris. The session was really informative. Uh, everyone, I will be running a short poll. Please participate in it. 
and meanwhile we will just take a couple of questions maybe one or two questions so if you have any questions feel free to enter them into the question box and i will pose them to boris and if we do not we run out of time as boris mentioned and we cannot get to your questions rest assured i will share the questions with boris and we will get back the, we will get back with the answers to you all right boris there is a question here are there any yeah. beacon products that can be deployed as enterprise honey tokens well actually the the now this uh, this field is really uh, you know uh, provide there are a lot of vendors actually they can do that uh, but i would name the the three of them that i know for sure that are doing a good job on that so uh, vendors that uh, kind of a short list for myself are ativo networks uh elusive networks and uh symmetria uh symmetria by the way did a very interesting presentation on black hat conference some years ago you can check it out on youtube about uh you know compromising uh, honeypots but these are the kind of the three top three companies that i'm thinking about uh, related to uh, implementing this type of uh, you know honey tokens and uh, and overall this technology but you know mainly these are the the things that I, I personally have some experience with. Right, Boris, another question that has come in is, can you please name a few open source honey pots? Uh, well, HoneyNet is the number one uh, project. As I mentioned before, uh, you know, this was in the wild for quite some time. And this is one of the well, most well developed and supported projects. So HoneyNet.org, I think it was uh or .net i don't remember the, the domain you know but you can find it very easily on the internet um and also uh, as you can see there are some other i just showed one of them in the honey bits is the other one open source and you can find a ton of tons of this in the uh in uh, in github uh, let's say word of caution here uh you have to be very careful of how this uh, how this open source project is supported uh, uh and what how what what's the community behind that or just a single you know developer working on that because uh, that's a very important issue mm, so be careful when you're trying to explore the the open source uh, honeypots mm. uh, so there, there's there's so many things like right now like, but you know uh honey uh honey d for instance is another one uh Compot, this is a scatter honeypot, uh, compot.org, for instance, and so many of them actually. Also, let's say, uh, as more com commercially, I forgot to mention the Rapid7, let's say, company providing also these capabilities inside of the managed detection response platform. But open sources are, you know, HoneyNet, uh, honey, uh, Honeycomb, uh, this is uh, HoneyD, open source honeypot and uh, com compot for instance for scatter and industrial control systems for instance. these are just a few of them i know there's a long list uh, of these projects running around but again be very careful with that because they may pose uh, additional problems if you implement them boris one last question for you how yeah. how would a kf sensor be for a honey pot i'm sorry can you repeat the question would a kf sensor be for a honeypot kf sensor this is a well-known honeypot basically but uh, again this is a um this is very old kind of a concept really it's still in use of course uh, but uh but what i talked about today is just um something that has to be seen as a, a kind of a suite of uh, products and, and services as a deception technology. KF sensor is still alive. This is, uh, you know, a Windows-based kind of cloud system. Uh, it can be used to experiment, to, to kind of, you know, um, use it as a kind of a proof of concept many times. But I don't, what my suggestion here is to look at this as a, as a comprehensive set of technologies, not just, um, I don't know specific honey pots or whatever so you have to look at this as a kind of a comprehensive suite of uh, of uh, technologies deception technologies because they give you the most of the value 
Otherwise, with the classic chemicals like KF sensor, it's 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 stable. It's it's been used for a while. It's okay, but it's have a limited point. You know, it gives you a limited capabilities compared to full stack deception technologies. All right, Boris. On behalf of EC Council and on everyone present here, I want to thank you for taking this very informative session for us. I'm sure everyone has learned a few tips and gained a lot of insight in this. Uh, everyone, the link to this recording will be live on YouTube shortly, and we will be also having another webinar next Wednesday at the same time. Do join us for the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.